Okay, I trust that everyone can see the screen. Yes. Okay. Welcome, welcome, Angie. We, we're just so you know, yes. we're recording. Sorry about that. I no thought I needed to sign in, and I was having trouble signing in. And then I tried so many times it locked me out. But I figured out I could get in without being signed in anyway. So. Hi, Angie. Okay, so um, let's go ahead and get started. So uh, we left off uh, with some of our editing functions. So now we're gonna get into some sound editing and then my favorite page of all the color page. So let's go ahead and start a new project. So I'm gonna click new project and we'll call this DaVinci cell class day two. All right. Okay, so we'll go into our media pool. We're gonna bring in some footage. So I'm gonna right click and go to import media. And let's go to that two shot with Emily and John that we had before. So I'm gonna change the frame rate to match, yes, okay. Now, um, like we discussed yesterday, I'm going to, I need to edit, these are separate audio channels, so I want to be able to edit those um, before, the, while they're in the timeline and, and uh, in the Fairlight page doing the audio work. So I'm going to go ahead and go up to clip attributes and I'm going to go to audio and I'm just going to change the track from stereo to mono embedded channel one i'm going to add another track make that a mono track as well and call that one embedded channel two and now the channel one that would be this microphone and the channel two that would be this microphone are now on separate tracks and can be edited independently of each other when i bring them into a timeline so let's go ahead and do that and we'll click on this create new timeline using selected clips we'll call this emily Go ahead and open our timeline. This shows some more real estate. I'm still getting used to. I have a my my computer at home. I have a PC with a huge widescreen monitor, so it's getting used to the real estate on a laptop again. Is it can really be a challenge. It seems really cramped. So, uh, um, but I I think I'm getting a handle on it again. It's been a while since I've edited stuff on a laptop, so this has been a good uh, refresher for me. Okay, you. so yeah, so okay. Um, so we're going to just scrub through, and I can see that check that that sorry that track two is recorded at a lower level than track so one. It looks like. So, uh, John, can you tell me what is production services here? Uh, production services. So yeah, that's really low. So what we can do with that is there's a volume control. It's a line. That's, that's here. Let me see if I can uh, enlarge these tracks a little bit. Then we're still on the edit page here. So there's a line here that you can grab and it will increase or decrease the audio. And it will also show you in decibels how much you're raising or lowering it by. So what I'd like to do to start with is just kind of make this average about the same height, like of these tracks here, try to get this in the same ballpark to start with. So when they talk amongst each other, production services here. Um, production services is when a nonprofit. So that's looking better. So uh, John, can you tell me what They're is peaking just here? a little bit above um, 10, and he's got a peak that's a, nonprofit or a, government a transient peak or around district. here, and he's around 10. So that's pretty good. Okay. So um, with the audio meters, a good range to try to stay within. I mean, if you've done a lot of editing, you probably already know this, but I'll, it's, it's always good to talk about. Um, try to stay for an average loudness or volume level 
uh, somewhere between minus 12 on an average with peaks around maybe minus six to minus five and try to stay kind of within this range. Um, if, the, if the sound goes up to zero or above, it can clip and sound distorted. And if it's on a master track, you can always pull that back and pull that down. If it's, if it's over recorded, there's not much you can do if it's recorded too loud to begin with. But if the audio recording is okay and it looks like most everything on here is good, then discuss um, what we can do. Basically, for it looks like it doesn't have a problem. There's a few yeah, peaks here, and I hear some lip smacks. So no, this line okay. here that we see, boy, that's that's a good one. It looks like there's a few more here. Okay, and possibly even. What we can do. Okay, that's not a lip smack. Okay, so let's scroll down a little bit, see if there's anything else we need to address other than just the volume. Okay, that's like a little thump. Okay, all right. So just as a reminder, one, th one thing that's good to do is to use markers uh, as reminders. So I'm going to, my problem areas here, I'm just gonna put a little marker there and then I think there's another one here. We can put a marker there. And here again, another one. And this is just something I do to remind myself of what I need to address when I scrub through the soundtrack and, and listen for anomalies. Okay. What is that flags button for? Flags is if, um, if you want to group some clips together, you can flag certain clips and then select those flagged clips if you want to do separate operations on those. Okay. All right. So let's see. Production. Okay. So I think. Oh. Okay. A little standalone click there. So let's maybe put a flag on that or a marker. Sorry. All right. So um, well, we see. I see a few hot spots here in the soundtrack in addition to the clips. So we'll take care of those. So let's move over to the Fairlight page, which is, which is our audio page. And I'm going to just, I still have mine on manual save. So I'm going to save mine. Okay. We'll move over to Fairlight. And now here we can expand our tracks by quite a bit. This is in size and this is temporally. You can stretch it out this way and it always stretches from wherever the playhead is centered. So if I move it, I can stretch it around. I can also resize it back to normal by hitting shift Z just like on the edit page that pops it back so I can see the entire thing. So first off, let's go through and see how our levels are. I think they're probably overall pretty good. Our school district has a budget for a production, and at that point, they come and talk to. Okay. And Emily's production services department. So John, can you tell me what is production services? So it looks like those are pretty good overall, but we'll make some tweaks to those. So let's start off with by um, going in and maybe getting rid of those clicks. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and zoom in here. All right, that's pretty good. Okay, Tony, quick question. This is yeah. kind of a nerdy question. Sure. Um, you know, I think I can't remember if Final Cut lets you get down to the sample or the frame. Is there? Is is there? Do you go down to the frame? Um, da Vinci, is it frame with sound? You can go down to the frame, and I think you can go to subframe sampling too. Okay. Um, one thing I've noticed though sometimes is when I'm putting on a um, a keyframe. Sometimes, if like if I were to put a keyframe here on this line, it might jump to one side or the other. Okay. Because it's it's trying to match to the frame, and in the, in the audio editor, you're not really seeing the frames. 
you're just seeing the audio tracks. So it may jump slightly to one side or the other, but usually that can, that's not much of a big deal. Yeah. Okay. So um, I'm going to work on Emily's track first and try to take care of this guy here. So what I'd like to do is whenever there's nothing going on, there's what's called room tone. So in this area here, it's just basically whatever low background sound there is. So whenever no, somebody's not talking, you get that low background sound. So what I want to do is cover up this with some a piece of background sound. So let's see if we can find something close by. So this is, we want to cover up basically from here to here, it looks like. So I'm just going to find a place that's close and I'm going to lock this track. This, this padlock keeps me from slicing into this track because I only want to affect this one. So a way to keep that from happening is to turn on the padlock and that locks that track and keeps it from being modified if you're working on a, an adjacent track. So I'm going to padlock it and I'm going to use my slicer and, and that would be control B on a PC and command B on a Mac. So I'm going to hit command B, put a slice in and hit command B again, take another slice. And then right now it wants to, to slip. So what I want to do here is increase my track size a little bit more so I can get my arrow in here. So I'm going to just select that and then I'm going to hold, hold down my alt key and I'm going to drag with my mouse while holding down the alt key and just let go and then cover that up. So when I play that now, Okay, and so we're good with that. So I'm going to move over to the next one. So I see another marker here. So let's go there. Let's zoom in on that. Okay, and I'm just going to take another piece adjacent. So snip that with Command B. It looks like a good size there. Snip it again. Click on it, Alt, drag, and we'll cover that one up. And today we're going to talk a little bit with John about our production services department. Okay. On over to the next one. That's a real good one right there. Okay. So that one looks like it might carry over, have a little bit of like, almost like an echo after it. So let's grab a bigger chunk for that one. So I'm gonna hit slice that one, bring it over here, do another one, click, alt, drag, and we'll just cover up this one right like that. Okay. And uh, what kinds of videos? All right, go back again onto the next one which I think is just a little thump. So we'll go in here. Yeah, all right. So I'll grab something that looks like about the same size. Drag that over about there. Slice it again, Alt, and drag over that. Okay, so let's design, zoom out and see what we have. I think we hit all of them. So if we listen. Hello, I am Emily Vidal here at Metro East. Okay. And today we're going to talk a little bit. Great. And uh, what kind of... All right. I think what's going on there is there's a little bit of a carryover on this one. So I'm going to switch tracks. I'm going to block that one and just go in here and just cover up that little snip right there. And slice that. Click in it, Alt, drag the mouse, and there we go. Okay see how we did. 
and at what kind there. of there okay that's much better all right now there was a click over here so let's go ahead and address that one again very quickly we'll just go in and grab that drag it over and that one's gone okay i'm going to save Out. Okay, I got meter range. All right. Okay, so far so good. All right. Now, if you notice over here on the track selector, you'll see that it shows you in the track how many clips are in that track. Now, now what we've done is we put one clip overall in the track, and we've made a number of cuts. So looking at the audio part, the audio sees that there are 17 clips in this track and nine clips in this track because we've done fewer edits in this track. But that's kind of handy to, to see um, that it, it shows you that amount of detail. So I'm going to zip back out again. And what I'm doing here, I can toggle on my zoom in and out by hitting Shift Z will toggle back and forth. And I can also use this guy to drag it back and forth. But Shift Z and Shift is the same on PC or Mac. So you can you can use the same control on either one. Okay. So that's looking pretty good. So we have a couple of peaks here. There's this one. And I think this one here. This one's not too bad. Yeah. Yeah, so we'll just see how far these peak up. Okay, this one goes up a little bit. So let's go ahead and take care of that one. So I'm going to go ahead and zoom in here. And here's where we're going to do a couple of keyframes. So to do a keyframe, you use your Alt key and a left mouse click will create a keyframe. And so I'll do one on either side, Alt, left mouse click, and Alt, left mouse click. And then I can take this and drag this down more in a range with the other clips. So when we, we play this, it's well within, in fact, I can probably pull it down just a hair more. It's within that range that we want, set. that sweet range. Okay. So we have this other one here. Let's go ahead and do this one. Shift, zip, and actually zoom in here. There we go. All right. And again, I'll do it sequentially this time. So Alt click, Alt click, Alt click and drag that one down there. Okay. And we've got a couple over here. So let's go ahead and zoom in there. And go in and alt. Click, click, and I'll click again. This one down a little and over here click 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 you can actually get to where you move pretty fast on this stuff so if we play that back um, well, that's a little bit hot still so we'll take these down a little more um, okay and even this one can probably stand to come down a little That's that's okay. All right. That's not too bad. Okay, that one might be a little bit hot. So let's go in and fix that. And I think that'll be our last one for today. 
right. Click, 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 and pull that down to kind of match the others. Now, sometimes people emphasize words a little more than others, some, usually at the beginning of a sentence. So if it's within the safe range, I will you sometimes let it go. If it go, if it peaks too high, then I'll address it. Okay, so I think we're good with that. And it looks like our mix is pretty good. So if I go back and play it, I'm going to go back to the beginning and just kind of scrub through it. Yep. And I'm John Lutz. And today we're going to talk a little bit with John about our production. Okay, I'm going to bring our master up just a hair. Services department. So, uh, John, can you tell me what? Maybe a little bit more. What is production services here? Um, production services is when a nonprofit or a okay. agency or a school. It's a little bit lower, which gives a little bit more safety and a little bit more headroom up here. So, I think that's pretty good. Okay. So, let's go back to our edit page. And we can put a transition on, we can fade in, fade out. So let's, um, now I sometimes don't, I myself, my own preference is not to start the video at frame zero to actually wait a beat. So if I take it up to maybe one second, I'm gonna select all clips by hitting Command A or Control A on the PC and just bring everything over. Oh, so I see I have my track still locked. So I need to unlock that so I can change it. So now I can bring everything over. And we're good. So now there's a little bit of a pause. And then the video comes up. And if we want to add a transition, we can right, we can hold our cursor here, right click. And this, the default is cross dissolve. So we can decide here um, how long a dissolve we want, or, if, or in this case, it's a fade in. At the beginning of a clip that's against where there's just black leader ahead of it, a cross dissolve acts as a fade. So let's go ahead and add a one about a one second fade to this. All right. Okay, so we've got a fade in. Now also, in addition to that, there's other ways to do fades. And that is there's a little corner gadget up in the in the corner of each track. And that can be grabbed and dragged and that can also create a fade. So I'm going to create about a one second fade there. And it gives you a num numerical display about a one second fade there. And about a one second fade here roughly be close. So that will also act as a fade. Okay, somehow, let's see, what did I do here? Not sure why that added a fade there, but I'm going to add another 30 frame and then a 30 frame. Another 30 frame here. Somehow if there was an anomaly that made it pop there. So let's go ahead and put these back here and here and here, oops, and here. There we go. So now this will fade out. Okay, so a couple of ways to do fades. Okay, now we have this, we have her introduction. Let's see what else we can do. Maybe we should add a real quick title to that. So we have a number of different types of title styles and maybe like one with a little bit of motion, a little bit of design. Doesn't have to be big. Ooh, I kind of like. Kind of like this one. That's very nice. I like the preview on this. That works really great. So I'm going to go ahead and put that on. So um, I'm going to give myself a little more real estate here. Let's drop this down, down here. Okay, I'm going to add a track. With the, so let's see which one did I pick this one. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and drop this on. 
So let's see where a good place is to position that. Okay, on the platform. Hello. Okay, maybe right there. Oh, I am Emily Vidal here at Venture Okay, Institute. sample text. Yep. All right. Let's work on that. So opening the inspector, I clicked on the clip. Opening inspector gives me access to the controls. So if I want to change the name from sample text to another title, let's come up with something really original like Emily and John. That's easy enough. Okay. There's that. So we have our title. I am Emily Vidal here at Metro East Community Media. And I'm John Lutton. Okay, I have, um, it's taking just a moment to render this out. There's a little red line above it. And in, let's see, where is it here? You have a render cache option. Uh, and this, you, this puts, when you drop an effect on, you can turn it on or off. You can have none, you can have smart, you can have user. Um, actually, I'll just turn it to smart. And that's, again, that's playback, render cache, and then nor, I think it defaults to none originally, so it won't cache it, but you can turn it on. And usually I just have it on smart, okay? And with it, if it fills up and, and it looks like it's, it's there, you're using up a lot of memory, you can actually go in and delete the render cache and it will clear it out and start again. It doesn't remove any media from the project, but it removes those render files. So you can start fresh. Okay. So again, it looks like it needs to recache that. So it looks like it's doing it. I'm John Lutzen from Venture East Community. All right. And today we're going to talk a little bit with John about our production services department. Okay. So now we have our clip. We've come in, we've placed a fade at the beginning and end. We have edited uh, the sound. And I think now we're about seven o'clock. So if we want to take a five minute break, when we come back, we can get into my favorite part of the program, the color page, can make a few adjustments to this before Tony, we get out. Tony, I have a quick question on the sure. uh, on Fairlight. I'm trying to, I can't get the, like is it? It's not automate. Is it automation? Like the rubber banding? Like where you add like a node and pull down? You can pull that. How did you do that again? Okay, so um, you hold your cursor over the line. Okay. Over the volume line, and you hold your Alt or Option key. Ah. Uh, Sorry, I was probably calling it the Alt key. I'm, on my keyboard, it says Alt and Option. I on see. the Mac, on the Mac, it's Option. On the PC, it's Alt. I got you. Okay. So, so it's alt or option click, option click, option click. I got it. Okay. Yeah. And then you can yeah. massage it. Yeah. Okay. Sweet. Thank you. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Save it. It's just a habit I have. You, I, I guess it's fine to do auto saves. I'm so used to just saving all the time. I guess I'll get used to it. The new version 17.2 comes with autosave already on. So it acts if you're a Final Cut user, it, it will be very familiar and that will anytime you make a change, it will automatically save. So I guess I'll go back to using that. Okay. Um, I guess we're good for about a five minute break. Is that good with everybody? Sounds good to me. All right. Okay, so let's say 710. It's about 7.04 now. Let's have a six minute break. Okay. And we'll come back and, and go into my favorite part. All right.
Okay, is uh, everybody back? I'm back. I'm here. Okay, great. It's hard to tell sometimes if you don't see a picture come up. <laughs> so, okay, so um, let's go ahead. So we're at this point, we've got a rendered title and we have our fades in. So let's go over to the color page. So um, in looking at this image, oh, and I'm gonna show you another, another key that you can use, hotkey. If you're on a PC, it's control F. And if you're on a Mac, it's Command F. And what that does is it takes your picture and makes it full screen. So if you don't want to just see your video in a tiny little window here, uh, you can click on Command F on a Mac. I'm oh, sorry, you have to click in here first. Command F on a Mac or Control F on a PC, so, uh, and you Jack, can play your video full screen. Um, production services is when a nonprofit or a government agency. Okay. So, in looking at this image, a couple of things kind of jump out at me. The blue is really intense back here, and the the cut the the curtain has a lot of color in it. But if you look at our two stars in front of it, they look a little bit on the dark side as far as lighting. That it's a little bit dimmer. Their skin is kind of pale and doesn't really pop and they don't seem to match the vibrance of the background. So let's see if we can do something like that. Well, and it's also, it appears to be kind of a little bit flat. So let's see, let's, let's see about toning down maybe some of the background. Uh, it looks like it's a, maybe could use a little bit of increase in contrast maybe too. Um, We'll pop them out and make them kind of stand out from the background a little more, add a little more of a dimension to it. And let's just see how we can do that. So I'm going to move over to the color page. Ah, I'm home. Okay, this is my, <laughs> if you can't tell, this is my favorite part of the, the program, the color page. This is what really sets DaVinci apart from other systems. This is how it started. Uh, DaVinci Resolve started back in in uh, the early 2000s by DaVinci Systems. They had made prior coloring systems called, I think it was DaVinci Express back in, I think starting in 1985. So they've been at this for a while. And the program was bought by Blackmagic Design in around 2009 and now it's owned by Blackmagic. And then they added editing and the Fairlight Audio and other, other functions to what started out basically as just a color corrector where you would edit in another package, you would import that edit into DaVinci and then color correct it, then ex export it again back out to whatever other package, Avid or whatever you were working in at the time. So, okay. So first off, let's do a, a quick overview of what we have here. So um, we have our viewer, and this is where a three button mouse really comes in handy. Uh, you'll notice around these windows, there aren't any drag bars like you would find like in, in the Navigator and Photoshop or in some other, I think in Premiere and some other programs, you can actually drag a bar to shift the image up or down or from side to side. And that doesn't exist here. So this is where a three button mouse really comes in handy. So if I want to scroll into the image or zoom in, I can use, I can scroll with my center scroller, my center mouse button and scroller will take me in and out of the image. And if I click and hold that center mouse button, I can drag the image around. And this doesn't drag it around on the canvas, it only moves it around in the viewer. So if I need to concentrate, say if I need to concentrate on Emily's face, I can zoom in on that. Or if I need to see John's face close up or some other feature, I can zoom in on that, zoom in and out. And again, uh, Shift Z pops it back out to normal to the to fill the border you can also click the fit command so if you're up here at 100 percent and you need to get it to fill the screen you can also just go back to fit and that will do the same thing all right you have a gallery which right now has nothing in it uh, what a gallery contains are still images and when you do color grading or color correction 
Um, once you finish a grade or a correction, then and you're satisfied with that image, if you want to record a snapshot of all of the things you did to that image, you create a still image. And so you would right click in the image with your mouse and select grab still. So we'll do that once we once we finish and we'll come back to that. Okay. Uh, another one are is the LUTs page. And LUTs are corrections for if you have a more modern camera that shoots in either a log format or a um, or a raw format, then you can use LUTs to con to easily convert that back to something that looks like it was shot with a regular video camera that would have the normal contrast and color uh, that you're used to seeing. And um, time permitting, we'll get into how to apply LUTs and and use those with raw and log footage. Okay. Um, media pool again, the same media pool that you have access to with all your other stuff, with all your other pages, your edit pages and everything, that same media pool is here. And also you can display your clips and track and your entire timeline up here. There is a timeline button that pops up a timeline that's very similar to the cut page. And here it shows our entire timeline plus our, our title that's shown here. And you can also hit clips and it will show as many clips as are in the timeline. And right now there's really only the one here, which is John and Emily. If we had a dozen different shots in here, those different dozen different shots would, would fill this area. Now you'll notice that the, it, the picture window shrinks each time I open one of these up. So when I'm doing a lot of color grading, quite often I'll open these to make sure I'm on the right clip to make corrections on. And then if I need this real estate back, I will just close these windows again. And then that gives me much more size to my screen. Okay. Um, now over here in this window, this is a window you'd probably want to leave open all the time. And this little gadget here is called a node. And what a node is, is a container that you can fill with corrections and with filters and with visual effects that you can apply to the picture. And it's kind of like, and I guess you could equate it kind of to an adjustment layer in Photoshop in that um, you can stack these and do a number of things. And there are also different types of nodes that we'll get into. The most common one is called a serial node. And when you, you can add more and more nodes out. So you can, if I want another node, I can add a node. And so I'll add serial and it creates another node. And if I wanna add another node, I can add another node to that. Okay. I can also add a node by hilt hitting either option or alt S for serial and on the keyboard and it will create a serial node. Other types of nodes are layer nodes and parallel nodes and outside nodes. Um, and we'll be using those as we go along. So to make corrections. So to start off with, we're gonna work on our first node here. And I, so it's highlighted. So whichever node is highlighted in red is the node that you're going to be using to make your corrections with. Okay, and we're we'll be using several tools on this. The first tool in our arsenal is the primaries color wheels. And these may look familiar if you've used these or something similar in Final Cut and in Premiere. Uh, they're somewhat similar. They may work a little differently, but they're basically the same. So you can, you can grab the lift is for the, the black level. So if you look to your right on the scope here, uh, Let's see, let me switch this. This is the waveform. And let's go to let's say the parade or something. And it'll show you the different components. This one shows them as the red component, the green component, and the blue component. You can see this blue is really intense. In fact, it looks like it's clipping. So we're going to address that while we're working on this. And you have your waveform, and you can actually turn the color um, on or off with that, uh, I think it's just the Y here, or you can 
uh, turn off the colorization of that. Um, I actually like the colors because it also gives me an idea of how they relate to one another. Uh, other scopes are the, and you can display more scopes. Let me show you that again. By hitting this gadget here, you can open up more scopes. So you, I have a vector scope and a waveform. Now, on a laptop or a, a very small monitor screen, the scopes can take up a lot of real estate. And if you have several open at a time, you can't shrink these lower. You can make them bigger than what they are, but you can't make them smaller than what they are here. Um, so if you're displaying more than one scope, um, they can eat up a lot of real estate. And, let, and quite often, if you have a dual monitor set up, you can have another monitor with just the scopes on it that can be really handy. And you can actually have uh, multiple scopes up. So you can have up to four scopes if you want. And you can select which one. So if I wanted to do the parade here, I can have all four scopes up. So this would be a waveform, a vector scope, a parade, and a histogram. And each one has a function. Each one monitors both the picture and color components in different ways. So um, that's the basics on the scopes. And I just default to usually using whichever scope I happen to be working on. If I, since I'm on the laptop, I, I don't have a lot of real estate. So I'll, I'll be using probably between this one and the parade quite often. All right. So the next tool we'll be using are the curves. And the curves work like just like curves in Photoshop. So I can increase or decrease the, the gamma or the midtones or bring up the shadow areas or just work on the highlights. I can also drag this and if I go down, it darkens the picture. If I go back this way, it lightens the picture. So we go from dark to light here. So this is bringing up the dark areas and this is bringing down the highlights, okay? Uh, back to our color wheels. So similar to the curves, the lift control works on the dark areas. So this is your black level, your, your lowest level here. And we'll want to make an adjustment to that because I noticed that um, this is the reset for each one of these gadgets. So if I want to put it back to zero, I can just click this little reset here in the different controls. So the lift control controls the black level, the gamma are the mid-tones. So the mid-tone of the image, quite often like skin and uh, neutral and middle gray values are, affect the mid-tones. And you can see how, if, if you look to your right, you can see how that kind of affects things on the scope, okay? Your gain or your highlights, and that affects the highest points of the image. So you can see how that seems to stretch the highlights more than the mid-tones or the, the dark areas. And then you have the offset. The offset is the global one that affects everything equally. So this is basically your exposure. Your overall exposure is done with your offset. Okay. Also, you have color wheels. So if I want to add coolness to my dark areas and turn them blue, I can do that. If I want to make my gammas yellowish and my gains greenish and really make it hideous, I can do that. Or, and uh, I can turn these off individually or up here in the corner of this resets all the, all the functions. So this is the master reset here. Okay, and I can also tint an entire image with the offset since it affects things globally. All right. So, you also have temp control. This is for color temperature. And so I can increase it. You can see it warms it or cools it. And if I need to reset this, I just double click on the, the name and it resets it. Tint works the same way. I can tint things. Contrast adds contrast or takes it away. Pivot uh, shifts where the contrast is centered. So if it's if you want to emphasize the contrast on the lower areas, you can lower it. And if you want to em emphasize contrast toward the highs, you can raise it. So it works in conjunction with with contrast. So I'm going to reset both of those. 
Uh, down here, you have color boost, which is similar to saturation. It makes things more vibrant. Um, you have shadows and highlights. They work very similar to uh, Photoshop or Premiere shadows and highlights. Saturation, of course, makes things bolder or, or um, more grayscale or down to black and white. You have hue, again, which works kind of like tint. It rotates around the axis there. So if you're looking at a vector scope, you can see the hue, it spins around, showing and emphasizing the different colors as I move it around. Tony, I missed the mid-tones. If I want to adjust the mid-tones. Yes. To adjust the mid-tones is the gamma control. So, gamma, OK. So if I go back here to waveform or parade, if I adjust the gamma, it adjusts the mid-tones. So again, um, lift is dark areas or black level gamma are mid tones or middle kind of middle grayscale areas gain are the highlights and offset is the global effect so this is your master exposure and color wheel Got it. okay all right so um the next tool we will be using is the qualifier the qualifier is like basically an eyedropper and it can select things to modify and then the fourth one that we'll be using right now is the window or power window, as we, as most people call them. And this allows you to isolate parts of the picture that you can modify within its boundaries or outside its boundaries. So um, let's go ahead and get started. I've created a couple of nodes already. So on the first node, let's go ahead and just kind of adjust our black level because I, I see there's kind of a fogginess to the dark areas. So I just want to bring that down just a little bit. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to get these points to kind of come close to touching zero without touching zero. So I'm going to bring this down just a little bit. I don't want to lose detail like in Emily's hair, but I just want to bring that down ever so slightly. So maybe just, just there, just a touch. And when you do a step like that um, and you want to keep things separate, you can name your node. So you can label it. I'm just going to call that, uh, I'll call it lift or the black level. Okay. And so that was that adjustment. And so here, um, I'll probably want to make a secondary adjustment. So this is a primary adjustment that I made uh, using the primaries here. And I'm going to make a secondary adjustment. And I also want to make um, adjustments to their skin tones because John actually said, oh boy, I look like I'm not feeling well. My, I have kind of a gray pallor. So I told him I can, I can definitely fix that. Okay, so um, we have our secondary here. So um, before I do that, I'm gonna create a layer node because I wanna work on the skin tones. And so I'm gonna add node, layer node. And this again works like a layer in Photoshop and a layer in Photoshop would be above the layer that it's affecting. When it creates a new node on here, it drops them below because the nodes start out up and they go down. So this actually affects things on here. This, if you think of it as being up here, this is what a layer node, how it shows up, but this is the effect it has. It, it affects things below it or actually above it here. And I know that's a mind bender, but it really, it really does work. Okay, so here I'm going to use my I'm going to use my um, curves, and I only want to really affect the blue because see how the blue is clipped on here. And in fact, if we go to parade, you can see that while the other colors are within norms, that the blue is just out of sight, and we're actually losing some detail because it's it's almost clipping, or it, actually it is clipping. So let's address that. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to break this chain because if I affect all of these, and you'll see that. If I'm making an effect, nothing happens. You don't see anything. That's because I have this layer node. So if I want to see what I'm doing back here, I can turn this off just by clicking the number. And then I can see the effect of what's beneath the layer node. So I just want to affect the one color. So I'm going to affect the blue color. So I'm going to break my chain here and I'm going to only affect blue. And if I pull this down, it's going to affect the blue channel and watch to your right. Watch the parade on the blue 
and how now I'm able to bring that down below 100%. And up here it's clipping. And if you look at the image around John, you'll see that you actually lose detail in the curtains. The higher the, the color is, the more detail is lost. So I'm actually recovering detail by bringing that down below 100%. All right. Now we want to go in and affect the flesh tones. And I noticed that it's 730. So do, do people need a break? Or would you like to continue on? Because this might be a good time for a break if you want a quick break, even a take a take in a five. I'm good for a break if but I could either way, whatever the other people want. Break, break is fine by me oh, too. Okay. Um, we want a five or 10 minute break. Five is fine. Okay. Five. All right, so um, why don't we split it down the middle and come back at 740. Cool beans. That work? Sounds good. Okay, great.
Okay, as soon as everyone's back, we'll continue on. Okay, so um, go ahead and I'll shrink my tab here. Okay, so uh, what we've done so far is in the first node, we made changes to our primaries with the lift. In fact, I'm gonna put primaries there, relabel that. Okay, and this will be secondaries so I'll just sec blue. And this helps me keep track and organize uh, the changes I've made. Okay, and so if I I've turn this off, you'll see that I've, I've made the changes. Uh, this layer node, since it's over the top of this one, if again, it's like this. Um, you won't see the changes on this one, but we'll be working on this one next and you'll see what cool things happen with this. Now this little gadget here, uh, when I created a layer node, you'll notice it created this. This is called a mixer node. And what this does is it combines or composites these two nodes together into one image. And then the output of that image goes to the next node. So it's a handy way of uh, mixing as you go, of compositing as you go, okay? So uh, now I'm going to use the qualifier. And we're going to take the qualifier and uh, I'm on a frame now. And you can scrub back and forth. I found a, this is a good frame for showing Emily's face and John's face. So um, let's, let's do some selecting. So with my qualifier, again, it works like an eyedropper, but I can actually click and drag it. And you can in some other programs too, but I'm going to need to do that here. So I'm going to actually zoom in with my mouse and move around with my by clicking the center button. And I'm going to select, I'm going to drag, click and drag this over Emily's face, kind of reaching the shadows and highlight areas and see what, what I get. Okay. And you'll notice that the node has changed over here. So what I want to do is see what I've selected with with the dropper, with the uh, qualifier. And so there is a little gadget up here that looks like a little magic wand. That's the highlighter and it will show what I've selected with, with the uh, qualifier tool. You can also hit shift H and it does the same thing. And that's the same on both Mac and PC shift H on the keyboard. We'll toggle that on and off. And now I can make further selections with my qualifier tools um, to, to further isolate their flesh tones uh, from the background. So um, I'm gonna, so this is my primary qualifier. Now I can add to this and subtract from it. So I'm gonna add a little more. So I'm gonna go in and drag a little bit more, see if I can kind of fill in a little bit more. It's pretty good, okay. I can see John's face is kind of filling in too. So I'm gonna come over here and select a little bit more. Okay. Now I've got a pretty good selection of their flesh tones. And if I need to refine that, I can also come down here and I can adjust the width of the selection that I've made. If I need to further refine it, it's looking pretty good. Go back up here closer to their faces. Okay, and I can also shift the range a little bit. So if I need to shrink things or grow them, I can do that. Okay, that's looking pretty good here. And the saturation. Okay, and then the luminance will help me isolate your primary flesh tones. Okay. So we have this selection and if I play it, you'll see that there's some chatter and kind of rough edges along there. So what I wanna do is smooth that out a little bit so it blends better. So if I make a correction, there won't be a chattery edge along the outside. So I would come down here to the denoise tool 
and by adding that, let's take it up around 10 or so. What it's doing is it's smoothing the edge. So if I zoom in here, you can see that as I do that, it kind of makes a fuzzy edge and kind of blends everything. And I don't need it to be very big. I just need it to take that aliased hard edge off, that stair stepping. Okay, so again, around 10 or a little over looks pretty good. And I can also add a little bit of a blur radius that fe further feathers the edge. And I'll take that up to maybe around eight or nine. Okay, and again, shift Z if I wanna see the whole image. That's looking pretty good. It looks like I, I may be missing a little bit here, but I think that's kind of a shadow area, but look, let's see if we can adjust the hue a little bit on that, maybe bring some of that back. Okay, if I bring it back on John, I'm losing part of Emily's face here. So I'm gonna find a happy medium between the two. So that looks pretty good. Okay, now I have this selected. Now I can affect this and because it's like an adjustment layer in Photoshop and it's over the top of this, this is now isolated, it's like a mat. And if you wanna see the mat area, you can click this little gadget here and that shows you kind of a black and white image like you would see in After Effects or in a, in a uh, if you're making a layer mask in Photoshop, okay? So, and this will toggle back and forth between the black and white mask and your highlight selection. Okay, so um, we can now turn this off. We've made our highlight selection. So I'm gonna hit Shift H or close this gadget here. So I'm gonna hit Shift H and turn that off. Okay, now we can affect their flesh tones. As long as this highlight, this node is selected in the highlight, then what we're doing here will affect this. And uh, if you have trouble seeing these, you have an adjustment tool that, let's see, I need to move my little picture window here. This can change the size of your nodes. So if I wanna be able to see these better, I can increase the size of the nodes so that they're a little bit larger and easier to read, okay? So, each node shows you the tools you use to make the adjustments. So right here, it shows that I made some changes in the primaries and in the curves. Here, it's just the curves. I brought down the blue. And here, I use the qualifier tool to make a selection. Okay, so this is the one we're working on right now. And this overlays on top of that. So um, first thing is, um, they look to be a little bit low lit and so what I'm going to do is increase the brightness a little bit on their faces. And there's a couple of ways I can do this, but I think I'll go back to the color wheel and I'll adjust the gamma because gamma adjusts mid-tones and flesh tones are mostly mid-tones. So let's see what the effect this has. So I'm gonna exaggerate it. I'm gonna move it way up and you can see that it's affecting basically just their flesh tones. And John has some of the same colors in his shirt. So it may make some of these colors pop but you can see now that I can make their skin brighter or darker. So I can take it either way. All right, so I'm gonna reset that. Now I'm just gonna nudge that up a little bit, just a few points, just to kind of make them pop a little bit from where they were. And if I wanna see a before and after of the effect, I can turn this node on and off and it will show you what I've done. So you can see that I filled in a little bit more brightness, not significantly, but enough to make them kind of pop out a little bit, but they still look pretty pale. So what I wanna do now is increase the saturation. And so let's increase the saturation, bring up the flesh tones a little more, cause we wanna kind of make them fit in the world of this really rich curtain. So we're gonna turn up the saturation here that's looking better. Okay, maybe right around 75-ish. Looks pretty good. Okay. And if we look at our vector scope, and I'm going to turn on the flesh tone line on the vector scope, which is, indicates the proper flesh color. So that's gadget. I can do that here, and it shows show skin tone indicators. So I'm going to turn that on, and it creates a line right here 
between kind of red and yellow that is the proper flesh tone color, which is actually orange. Uh, all, most all flesh tones are basically just orange with different amounts of luminance and saturation. So I'll click back out of that. And it looks like I'm, I'm hitting that pretty well. I'm going to over exaggerate it. So I'm going to really crank it up here. And I'm going to adjust this back and forth, which is the hue. So you can see I can they can talk till they're blue in the face. Or they can be from Mars or, or any other place. So um, it doesn't take a lot to adjust this hue. But I just want to see as I if you watch the scope, you can see that kind of go back and forth. So I want them to be kind of on the line with the flesh tones, not heavily. So I'm only moving at a few percent. And so now if I bring the saturation back down to where I had it, I think that's pretty good. Maybe, maybe a little more, just so they kind of mix in with the background here. All right. So now they kind of pop out a little more. Now, to be able to see a before and after of everything we've done so far, there is another tool up here. And this will bypass color grade and fusion effects. So we're in color, so it's going to bypass all color grades and show us what we started with. So you can see now the difference that we've already made just by adjusting these controls. Now with the blue isn't as intense, but there's still a lot of color there. And now they seem to kind of pop a little bit from the background. Okay. And it's pretty good. It's more three dimensional. I think we can actually make add another a little more depth to it. So let's add another. Let's go to another node. So let's go to this node. This is past the mixer mode. So these two layers have mixed together. This has mixed with this one. So this overlay overlays the flesh tone. And these two feed into this mixer node. And then this feeds into the node after that. OK, so what we want to do with that is uh, they're standing in front of a curtain. And quite often, if they're standing in front of a curtain, it's like, like if you watch The Tonight Show and you see the host come out. Uh, for me, it was Johnny Carson and Jay Leno. Now it's uh, Jimmy Fallon. So you see the host come out and, and uh, perform. And quite often, they have a little bit of a spotlight on them. So let's see if we can add a little bit of an effect like that. So we're going to create kind of a little bit of a spotlight effect give, to kind of make them stand out a little more from the background. So we're going to go over to our window, our power window. And I'm going to select the circle. And that pops up in the frame. And now everything you can, can be affected either within the circle or outside the circle. So right now, I think what we want to do is first, let's enlarge it. And if we need to more space, we can always go outside the frame. It doesn't matter. It's not limited by the boundaries of the frame. And let's kind of see what we can come up with on this. This is your fe edge feather. This is the boundary of this. And this is your edge feather. This spreads that boundary out to, to, to where it can be a very sharp edge or a feathered edge. So let's just drag this out a little more, maybe close to the corners out here and see what, what we can come up with. So they're both within the boundaries of the hard edge. And then we've got some feathering going on. So to affect this, we want to go back to our curves. And now I'm still on the blue channel. So if I make an adjustment, it's only going to adjust the blue channel. So I want all I want to adjust everything, including the brightness. So if I hit this little link button, it turns everything back on. So now if I make an adjustment, it affects everything equally. So I'm going to pull this down. OK, and you'll see what's happening is that it's actually darkening on the inside, which is not what we want. We want just the opposite of that. So what we can do is we can go back to the power window and we can click this little gadget here, which inverts the power window. So instead of everything happening inside, it can happen outside. So um, we can do that. So we can pop this on. We can go back to this. And if we pull it down now, it affects everything outside of the window. And you can see now we're creating this kind of vignette or spotlight effect. OK, we don't need it to be too severe. We just want to we don't really want them to be like a spotlight. We just want a, a very subtle effect that kind of pops them out of the background a little more and adds more depth because what we're going for is depth here. So 
again, if I turn this on and off, you can see how everything is kind of flat and kind of um, desaturated. And here it looks like they have warmth, they have a lot more color in their faces, and they really kind of pop in three dimensions from the background. And so what we've done is we've built what's called a node tree. And a node tree is a collection of nodes that are several steps in a correction or a color grade. And so I'm going to go ahead and label this one node label. I'm going to call this one skin tones. OK. And this one I'm going to call, oh, vignette. OK. So in these steps, we've gone and let's see, I'll, uh, I'll go full screen with this. So we started out, this is our result. We started out and uh, if you're in the full screen and you wanna see it before and after, it's option or alt D. So here's where we started and here's where we've ended up. Just by using those tools, you can see that we've made a big difference in this picture. And so now they're, they look more three-dimensional and they pop from the background and they have much more vibrant skin tones than they did before. All right. So now we've gone through and we've made all these corrections. And if we decide that um, if there's any other clips of these that we need to correct right now, we just have this one. But if there were others, then we could apply the same effect to, to that. So um, I showed you earlier how there was a gallery. So if we want to save this, for use in other parts of our of our timeline or project, then we can click grab still and it creates a still image. Now the still image is not only a freeze frame of this that you can also save and use as a, as a freeze frame in your program. You can right click on it and you can save it. You can export it as a, as a freeze frame. But also it contains all of your color correction information embedded in it as, a, as kind of a sidecar. So you have your still image, and then you also have the data of the entire node tree that you've done the correction on. So if you have another clip like this that was uncorrected, then you could click on this and click apply grade and apply it to another clip. And you wouldn't have to do this all over again for every clip, because if there are other clips that were similar to this, you could just apply the grade to those and you would be done. OK, so now we've done we've learned our basics of the color page and how to, you know, there, there are many more tools that we didn't touch on that are much more advanced. If we have time, we'll go back and cover some of those. But uh, let's go ahead and get this ready for export. So we've done, we've gone through our media pool, our cut page, our edit page. We skipped over fusion. That's a deep dive after effects type part of the system. We're on the color page now. We've already done our, our audio correction and we're ready to deliver. So let's go to the deliver page. And as with all other parts of the program, everything shares the same timeline. So your timeline is available in any of these pages um, that's, that's up here. So we have our timeline here. If I want to see the whole thing, um, I can squeeze it back and forth here. I can hit shift Z and do it. And here you have up in the upper left hand corner, you have the options of your output. So you can render out in all these different formats. So you have a custom one that you can do yourself. You have a preset for YouTube and Vimeo and Twitter. You have Apple ProRes. Now in the Mac version ProRes is the standard master output. And the one thing that is kind of different between the Mac and PC version is that on the Mac you have ProRes out and on the PC you have DNX HD or HR, which is basically an Avid or a Windows version. In every way, the same quality of ProRes, but it's not an Apple product. And it's just a matter of licensing. Apple, I don't think has played well with DaVinci and has not granted DaVinci a license to be able to put ProRes on the Windows platform, 
although Adobe Premiere does does have that option now uh, for the past last few versions where you can output in ProRes on the Windows platform. So uh, that's one difference, but it really doesn't matter quality wise. Okay, here you have H.264, H.265, which can be a 10-bit file, 10-bit uh, color, IMF, Final Cut Pro 7, so it's backwardly compatible, Premiere, XML, which is uh, your timeline data. If you need to send it back out to either Final Cut or Premiere, you can do that. Can you, uh, can you import a Final Cut 7 file into into uh, yes, you, DaVinci? Yes, you can. Do you have to export it as an XML first? Yes, yes. In fact, um, on Adobe Premiere, you can export as a Final Cut XML, and you can bring your timeline. You can export your timeline from Premiere and as a Final Cut XML, and then import that XML into DaVinci, and it will do its best to recreate your timeline. Wow. And then you can do your color grading and then export that or render that back out. I was just curious because I, I have a bunch of Final Cut 7 like stuff that I'd never like lifeboated into Final Cut Pro. Yeah. Uh, into X or whatever. And so they're mm -hmm. sort of just stuck in Final Cut 7 land. So yeah. Yeah. Just curious. Yeah, and I, I think here at Metro East, we actually have at least one or two computers that still have the original Final Cut um, Studio, Final okay. Cut 7 on them. So if you have a legacy project, I think we may have at least one or two computers around that still, okay. I think a couple of the old Mac towers might still have it. That'd be helpful. Thank you. Tony. Okay, so, sorry. Do you have another another comment or question? No, that was a non sequitur. Thank you. Okay, okay. <laughs> so um, for this instance, let's go ahead and, and select ProRes for our output file. And this gives, gives us some options. So you can render, what's unique too about DaVinci that I really love is you can render everything as a single clip or a, a single movie, or you can render it as individual clips. So if you have a timeline that's made up of a lot of different clips and you wanted to export each clip individually into a bin for another editor, you could select individual clips and it would render all of the clips in the timeline as individual clips, which is mm -hmm. really handy. Um, especially if you're dealing with things like stock footage um, and you don't want to send somebody a clip that's all one piece and they have to go through and slice it up again to use it, then you can export that as individual clips and then they can have, they can go through and, and rename the clips if they want and have access to those as separate clips again to put into their own productions. Can you do that with handles on them? Um, in this point, I don't. I don't believe so. I've no. Okay. I, I don't think that's an option. It will just basically render them out as they are in the timeline. Okay, just curious. Yeah, but when you archive uh, a project, you can specify handles on that. Okay. When you archive it. Okay. So, so this one we're going to render out as a separate clip, and so these are the video settings. Pretty much, I leave these alone, uh, except for maybe the quality settings. Um, I don't know if I need to go as high as is HQ, so I'll make it a, a standard Apple ProRes 422. Everything else looks good. It's HD, it's 2997. Um, the advanced settings, I don't really need to mess with the advanced settings at all, uh, except if you want to maybe force sizing to highest quality or something, but I think it's already there. So advanced settings are nice and sometimes I'll use them, especially if I'm dealing with raw files or, or log files, sometimes I'll I'll switch those on or, or, or make use of them. But for, for this, we don't need to worry about that. So, okay, um, I've got that set audio. Uh, pretty much I leave everything uh, that's specific to the format in place. And then file, if you need to do custom names or custom suffixes or have a subfolder for it to go to, if you need to specify certain amounts of digits in the file name, you can do that. Um, and also it will give you a before and after um, uh, space available on your drive if you're getting low on space. So, okay, so we have this ready to go and I know we're already at eight o'clock, but let's go ahead and, and render this out. So I'm gonna browse for where I wanna put it. And again, with our folder structure, I like to put things all within the one folder if I can. So I'm gonna go here to training, DaVinci Resolve training, and I'm gonna select the deliverables folder to save in, because this is a deliverable. So 
there we go. I'm going to save it. And I'm going to go and look over this. Okay, we have to name it. So I'm going to call it Emily and John. Emily and John. Uh, vibrant, let's call it. Okay, just for fun. All right, so now we have our name, we have our location, where to send it. And if you're familiar with After Effects, uh, when you do a composition in After Effects, you send it to a render queue. Also in Premiere, it sends it to a render queue, or you can do a direct export in, in, uh, in Premiere. So this works very similar. So you can add to render queue, and it will pop it over in here, and it says job one. So you can go through, if you have multiple timelines, you can save multiple timelines and stack up a whole bunch of projects and then just render them out all at once or you can select them individually and render individual ones out. So we have everything in place. So let's go ahead and click render all and it will go through and render our project out and put it in our deliverables folder. Now up here in the corner of the frame, you'll see this number that changes. Now it's at 66, 69. That's the frame rate that it's exporting at. So right now we're doing really well. We're exporting at over twice the frame rate. So however long the video is, it's rendering out at over twice the, the play speed of the video. So we're doing really well. Sometimes if you have a lot of effects or a lot of heavy color corrections and filters and other things, it can really slow down your system unless you have a really powerful graphics card or a lot of memory and, and a fast CPU to make up for that. So it's already rendered out. So um, we've done that, we've done this, but this isn't the only way to render out so quickly I'm going to move over back to our cut page. And again, the timeline is available in every page. And up here in the cut page, and this is not available in the edit page, just the cut page, because everything happens quick in the cut page. You have quick export. So again, uh, it doesn't give me all of the, the stuff that the, the other one has, all the settings. But if I want to do just a really quick export, I can do that. So if I want to do an H.264 export, I can click on that or a 265. This is only an 8-bit file, so 264 is okay. So I'll click that and I'll hit export. And it will ask me where I want to save it. I think I'll put it in the same folder as before. So I'm going to go down to my training folder and DaVinci Resolve Training, deliverables. And I'm just going to call this one Emily and John. Uh, let's call it uh, MP4 or something. Basically, uh, MP4. Yeah. All right. You click that. And it starts exporting. Now, just like in Premiere, if you do a direct export, you can't really use other parts of the program until it's finished exporting. So if you have other things to do, you can go off and do them while this is exporting because you can't really do anything until it finishes. Fortunately, this is a short video, so uh, it exports fairly quickly. So this again is if you're in a hurry and you need to just get cut something in the timeline, you need to export it right away to a folder without having to go through a lot of settings and things like that. You can just quickly export out of here and now it's, it's already done. So now we have our exported files. I can go to my desktop go down to training, go down to my resolve folder deliverables. And you can see that these two are the ones that are in here. And if I select one of those and open with VLC, that'll play the clip that we just rendered out. Hello, I am Emily Vidal here. Uh, okay, just, <laughs> okay. I'm going to just close that. Another software update. And today we're going to talk a little bit with John about our production services department. So, uh, John, can you tell me what is production services? That's here? just my mouse. Production that's services up. is when a nonprofit or a government agency or a school district um, has a budget for a production. And at that point, we come and talk to myself and Emily um, and we discuss. Um, what we can do basically for their budget for you guys. And uh, what kinds of videos uh, have you produced? 
Um, well, recently we've done everything from fundraising videos to training videos to public service announcements. I mean, it really is um, a whole different range of things we can do for nonprofits. Do you have a favorite format that we've produced here? Um, I really like public service announcements. All right, well, thank you so much for telling us a little bit about that. Thank you for asking such incredible questions. You're welcome. Okay, so that ends the basic training part of this. So um, let's take a break and maybe come a five minute break and come back at 8.15. And I will show you something very quickly that's a, a handy, another really handy tool that DaVinci has. And I don't know if it's been implemented in other ones yet, but it, it can really save you a lot of time if you're working with someone else's existing video that's already been edited and they ask you to make corrections to it. So um, we can go ahead and take a five minute break and come back at say at 8.15, that's okay. Sounds and good. this will be brief. And then we have, uh, uh, Seth has a survey he wants to do right after that's that. That's right, that's right, so, survey. Thank you for reminding okay. me. Okay, all right. Okay, let's take, let's take a few minutes and come back at 8.15.
me as soon as we're all back, then uh, I'll show you a really neat trick <laughs> that I think everyone will like. Is everybody back? Reporting for duty. I can see. I can see. Gina. I'm here. Okay. All right. So this neat trick is something that can save you a ton of time if you have to go in and make changes to a video that already is edited and in a and it's in its own video and you don't have access to original materials. So we're going to start off with we're going to need a bin for this. So I'm going to add a new bin and. I'm not going to even name it for now. I'm just going to open it. So we're going to import this into a new bin. So this is this is on the uh, we're on the media uh, page, the very first one. And so I just created a new bin. And what I want to do is import a video. And in this case, I have to use the browser that's within DaVinci Resolve. So I have already created a pathway for it. But if you need to create a new path, and if it's not already listed here, you can right click and click add new location. And it will create a new location that you can go through like a browser and find a folder that you want to pull in footage from. So in this case, I have this one. So I'm going to, to go there. I'm going to go to finished examples. And I'm going to select this edit, which was done a few years ago as in one of our editing classes, and it's a final result of what an edited video can look like. So say it's it's already been done and someone said, oh gosh, you know, I wish I'd made these changes to it. Can you go in and fix this? And I'll say, sure, of course I can. And so uh, what I want to do with this is I want to bring it in and I want DaVinci Resolve to do all the cuts for me. So if I needed to, to make changes, like if I needed to make a color correction on a shot, I'd have to go in and, and physically slice all of these shots in the timeline, uh, which can be very tedious work. And so what I want to do is, is take that tedium out of the work and really speed up my workflow. So I right clicked on this clip. I'm going to go down to scene cut detection, and it's going to look for any changes in the video that where the scene changes. So I'm going to click that. It's going to search through video and it's going to create a cut every time there's a change. Okay. And it's got a list of cuts. I'm going to add all these to the media pool. I'm going to click add to the media pool and then I can close this window out. Okay. Now within that bin that I created, I have all of these cuts, lots and lots of cuts. Okay, so uh, I have so many that I actually have to use my gadget here to shrink everything down. So you can imagine doing this manually would take a lot of time. So I'm going to select all of these. I can um, hit Command A or Control A in here and select all of them. I'm gonna select Create Timeline from Selected Clips Yes. Okay, now if I go into my edit page, I can see that I have my entire timeline and everything is already cut for me. <laughs> so this is a huge time saver and it really can save you a lot of time. So if I need to go through, say if I need to, to do a quick correction on Emily here and they say, oh gosh, she, her, her picture is too bright. She's a little bit overexposed. I can quickly take that, go into the color page. I can create a couple of extra nodes. I can add a layer node, go in, and it looks like the rest of the exposure is pretty good, except her face is a little bright. I can go through and I can use the qualifier and quickly pick out or flush tone, oops, let's see, qualifier. There we go, it helps if I am on the right tool, okay. 
pick out our flesh tone here. I'm going to go through and denoise that a little bit and add a little bit of blur to it, maybe finesse it just a tiny bit here. Okay. And there, that's pretty good. All right, so I'm just going to bring down the exposure on her skin tone. So I'm, it's, a, it's highlights, so I'm gonna bring the gain down on that. Give her a better exposure. I can check the exposure on the waveform monitor. And if I click here, see it because it's clipping because the highlight is too bright, I can bring that down. I'm going to close this window so I can see more of the screen. And you can see that I brought her skin tone down into an acceptable range here. So now it's much nicer. Okay, but she still has, there's still some um, you can see there's still some texture on her face. She's got kind of a shine. So let's do her a favor and de-age her a little bit. So what I'm going to do here, I'm going to go to my mid-tone detail. And again, I can sharpen it or I can take it away and watch the years fade away. Okay, I think I've gone a little too far at 100%. So I'm going to go back. I'm going to leave a little bit there. Let's go to maybe 70 or 75. Uh, maybe right about there. That looks pretty good. OK, so here's a before and after. All right. And again, I'll go full screen with it. And this is before and after, before and after. You can see. You can be everyone's best friend <laughs> after you perform a simple trick like this. Uh, you don't tell, have to tell them how it was done. Um, this will just be our secret. So uh, now if I wanted to copy this really quickly, I know we need to get to the survey. So if I wanted to go to my gallery of clips and say I wanted to copy this to another clip, I can select the other clip. I can use my left or sorry, my center mouse button and click on it and boom i've just color corrected another clip another way now if i use the gallery that i showed you before i'm going to select this grab a still frame here's the gallery i can select another clip i can click on this that has all the grading info on it select, select apply grade and i can apply that grade to another clip so i can just go down throughout the timeline and either by clicking with the mouse button or otherwise changing that and being the hero of the hour. Okay, so here's the result. What are the things to watch out for? Okay, so before and after, before and after. So I've already gone through and made a huge difference, and everybody's happy. So um, I'll turn it back over to Seth. I'll go ahead and stop my screen share. And does anybody have any last questions? I do, Tony. Yeah. Um, I'm just wondering, you know, um, I know you've worked in Premiere and maybe you still do, but um, it, it on just- occasion. On occasion. It feels to me like the color grading tools in DaVinci are just a lot more intuitive. Um, they are. Okay. In, in uh, between the two, because I, I was a big fan of the, the Lumetri color corrector in Premiere until I really got into DaVinci and saw just how amazing the tools were in that and how, and they quickly left Premiere behind. And Premiere has some great tools, but this just beats the heck out of Premiere as far as the color grading options that it has. And the flexibility and intuitiveness of the tools are, are much better. Do you ever, um, I, you know, um, where I work, we're all, you know, based on Premiere. So I don't know that I'm going to be able to completely switch over. But what I'm thinking about is, you know, doing a lot of my editing in Premiere and then exporting a ProRes file and color grading that in DaVinci Resolve. Does that make yeah. sense? 
that you yes it does and you can do it one of two ways if you if it's a finished video and you need to make changes you can or if, if it's just a timeline without titles you can export it as a movie file and use the technique i just showed how to bring it in and, and auto cut it or you can export it as an xml file and bring in that xml file to davinci and tell it to import xml awesome thank you okay um, now one thing I, I didn't do let me let me show you something really quick here and i know we need to go um, back on the page here um, now we i have this i can um, i can export this project so i have this project i want to save it and then uh, i can export it again to that folder that i showed you the training folder here and this is this is my own folder but i have nothing in the projects folder here so far so if i want to save that project externally i can save it to that folder and it and it shows as a, it's called a drp file for davinci resolve project so that's how you can export your your file if you want to share it with someone else and um, have, have access to it and also have it uh, back up off the system. Okay.